We learn wisdom from failure much more than from success. He is no fool who pets with that he cannot keep to get that which he shall not lose. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he who wins a soul is wise. Our topic tonight is the conditions for blessings in Psalms 91. Psalms 91 had been a common Psalms that many Christians always love to recite, love to confess, love to keep their eyes upon, especially when they go through things of life, especially when they face realities of life in a form of embarrassment or danger. They will recite Psalms 91 or they quote it. But we must understand there are conditions for this particular portion of the scripture to be real in our lives. There are conditions that we need to sink into our soul in order to embrace this Psalms 91. So that when we confess it, we confess it with full heart. We confess it with full knowledge. We confess it with the reality that yes, we know what we're talking about. So that we don't need to confess it just because we feel like saying it because others are saying it. There are blessings there, but there are also conditions. We can find about 15 conditions there in order to have this blessing fulfilled in our lives. Especially when we face danger. Because we know that Psalm 91 is some that everyone, every Christian, always hold on during the time of danger. During the time when we are facing threat from the evil one. The condition for inheriting and enjoying the promises of God in Psalms 91 is dependent upon what is stated in the book of Exodus chapter 15 verse 26. If we go a moment in the book of Esther, chapter 15, verse 26, it says, And said, If you diligently heed, my, heed the voice of the Lord, <clears throat> you are God, and do what is right in his sight. Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. If you will diligently hear the voice of the Lord your God. And do what is right in his sight. If you will diligently obey the voice of God. And do what is right. Many of us know what is right, but we choose not to do them. Many times we do things out of our own impulsive nature. Many times we do something that is wrong because we want to please our friends. We want to please our siblings. We want to please our parents. Or maybe we want to please self. You know what you're going to do is wrong, but you end up doing it. The next moment, when there are threats, you begin to confess Psalm 91. He who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You forget to know it does not work like that. This is the problem. We cannot twist God's hands. And God cannot be bribed over. Because God does not take bribes. If you can diligently obey his voice and do what is right in his sight. What is right? Love those who hate you. Yes. Love those you are told to love. Even those who hate your enemies. Give cold water to your enemies who thirst. Give them food if they hunger. Show compassion. Have mercy upon people. 
even though they don't deserve it. Don't be easily provoked. Don't show, throw your anger, throw your weight here and there. Be angry, but sin not. All these are God's word. We know it. We understand them, but we don't apply them in our lives. We never even make some effort to keep the word of God or his word. We know all. We have been taught, but we choose not to. Now we go back to the book of Psalms 91. The first verse there it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The, what is the condition? That's the blessing. The condition they say, He who dwells in the secret place, who, who, who abides or shelter under the Most High, then what will happen? You will receive this blessing of the Almighty. Which means if you don't dwell, in the secret place of the Most High, you are not going to abide under the shadow of him. That's what it is. Do you allow yourself to hide under the secret place of the Almighty? How can you, when you choose to do things contrary to God, in the way you think, in the way you behave, in the way you even relate to people, you completely abandon God, do what you choose to do, do things your heart are dictated to you, and what do you do? You say, well, I, 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 I just want God's justice. Doesn't our heart prick us that what we're doing is wrong? Therefore, we're actually moving away from the secret place of the Almighty. Do you know that God will even use you more than you ever imagined if you can just begin to obey him? Regardless of how tough you think it is. Yes. Do you know when you obey the Lord, his heart is warm towards you. And his blessing is upon your life. Just because you choose to obey him. Without considering the cost. That's why we talk about dying to self. Dying to self is obeying God at all costs. Regardless of how you feel or how it hurts you, you just choose to do the right thing. If you diligently obey my voice and do the right thing in his sight, that's what the Bible says. Which means you are actually dwelling under the secret place of the Almighty, dwelling at the shelter of the Almighty. Secondly, if you want to embrace the blessings of Psalm 91, you must always declare that God is your refuge. God is our refuge, a place of resting. How can we declare that God is a place of our refuge when we are not walking right with him? You cannot stay together with somebody whom you are not in good terms with. You feel uncomfortable. But shamelessly many times we claim God is my refuge Why we don't walk with him. Why we are in enmity with him. Why we never gotten ourselves reconciled to him from our wayward ways. So for us to enjoy that blessing, we must learn to declare the Lord is our refuge. But before you say the Lord is your refuge, you must ask yourself a question, are you in good terms with the Lord? Oh, I prayed, but I'm not seeing any result. Because you know yourself. We know ourselves that we're not in good terms with the Lord. Something is wrong somewhere. No matter how you pretend, when you see people begin to speak in tongue, begin to speak in the spirit, so that people call you that you are spiritual, but deep down you know you are not. You can prophesy, you can see vision, you can see revelation, but you know you are not in good terms with God. You don't need a prophet to tell you that. But the will of God for you to enjoy that blessing because he kept it for us. Especially during the time of danger. Next, we must also assert that God is our fortress. When we talk about, if you want to enjoy, must say, yes, the Lord is my fortress because he's your stronghold. Strong foundation. A cornerstone 
that holds your life that nothing can shake you up. That's why regardless of any situation that you go through, whatever you go through, the cornerstone that holds you cannot be shaken because he is there by your side. Yes, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away because the word of God is by you, and that word of God is God himself. Because John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word is God. It's by your side. Because you know the Lord is your fortress. Nothing can shake you up. Nothing can keep you away from that protection because it's right there by your side. Regardless of how people see, oh, he's going to be killed, he's going to be crushed. The Lord is by your side. That's what we saw about Jeremiah the prophet. Whatever they plan, put him in dungeon, God always bring him out. One way or the other. Because the Lord was his fortress. Fourthly, in the same verse too. For us to enjoy the blessings of Psalm 91, we must certify that God is our God. That God is our God. Is God your God, the Almighty God. Is Yahweh your God, the Almighty God, the ever living God, the ancient of days, the El Gibo, El Perazim, El Shaddai, El Betel. Is the God of Abraham, is he your God? The God of Isaac, is he your God? The God of Jacob, is he your God? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is he your God? That God is your God. If you say God Almighty is your God, then you must learn how to walk as he walked. You must do things as he does. You must obey his word to the last moment of your life. By the way you speak, by the way you behave, by the way you act, by the way you relate to people, by your character, by your mannerism, everything will reflect God. Even when you're pushed to the walls, you not throw your anger, throw your tantrum. You hold on to the word of God and know that the Lord, if the Lord is by your side, nothing can overwhelm you because victory is yours. Look at what Jehoshaphat did. Jehoshaphat, who knew about his God, just as Daniel declared, those who know their God will be strong and do great exploit. Daniel 11, 32. Because they know their God. Jehoshaphat knew his God in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. The Bible said when great multitude came against one tribe of Israel, Judah, because Jehoshaphat knew his God, he called entire inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Judea, Judeans. All of them, he called them, all the people of Judah. And they begin to fast and seek the Lord. He did not go and look for help here and there, but he sought the Lord his God. Because he knew that nothing is impossible with God. That is why God asked this question in Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for me? God is asking you this question. Is anything too hard for me? The situation you are, is it too hard for me to turn it around? No. Luke chapter 1 verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. It talks about God, God. If you have these things in your life, no matter what you face in this life, you will never, never allow anything to make you like an orphan without a heavenly father. Yes, things will come, you get shaken up, but still you are not shaken up that you have forgotten about your God. You still hold on and know that my God is able. Look at the relationship Daniel declared. When the king came to the lion's den and cried out and said, Oh Daniel, the son of the most high God, has God whom you worship there and might be able to save you? Look at his statement. He says, Oh king, live forever. My God has sent his angels to save me. My God. So here, if you say God is your God, will you say the same thing? My God has done it because he found me innocent. My prayer is that you and I will be found innocent in every situation. Let it be that whatever you go through will be a false accusation. Let it be that people have misunderstood you, but not because people know that you did it. Not because you are caught doing those evil. 
You can hide it, but you cannot hide it from God. Therefore, come out from those manipulative ways of living. Come out from those lying. You lie. You think others don't know. Listen, you lie, you are deceiving yourself. People always know that you are lying, but they always keep quiet. Leave you alone. That's why I say, leave, leave a fool at his follies. Many times people come to me, they lie. They think that I don't know. I just, okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, leave you alone. If you think that lies will help you, so be it. It will help you. But if you stand by God, nobody can block your way. Daniel know it. Abednego, Shadrach, and Meshach know it. In Daniel chapter 3, they told the king, Oh, king, listen. Even if our God did not save us, we are not going to worship your God. But God proved that he is God and saved them from the fiery furnace. These are practical examples that can make you to hold on to God to say, God is my God. God is my God. God gave a promise to Abraham and he fulfilled that promise. God knows what you're going through. For you to claim this promise that God is my God, you must know that really God is your God. You, and you're not saying out of your lips, but from the heart of your heart, that yes, you know whom you follow. That's why Apostle Paul said, I know whom I follow, for I am persuaded that what I have committed into his hands, he will keep it against that day. What a statement. And the same thing must go through all of us. That our God is God. Fifth condition in verse 4. We must confirm that God is our trust. That God is our trust. For you to enjoy this blessing of Psalm 91, you must always confirm that God is your trust. Which means you have your trust in him. You don't have any doubt. You have not you haven't any iota of doubt that God is able, that he is able, that he is able. That is why the Bible declared in the book of Psalm 1 and 25, verses 1 and 2, that those who trust in the Lord will be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. As Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains, so the Lord surrounds his people now and forevermore. Isaiah the prophet declared the same thing because of trust. He knew what it means to trust the Lord. In Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, you will keep him in perfect peace, O oh Lord. He who trusts you, trusts you in Jehovah, for he is your everlasting strength. Do we trust him? When you go through things, maybe you have some hate. I said, yes, I know this will happen. Not that you believed, but it just in your mind is maybe. If that thing doesn't work, uh, all the trust you have in God collapse. Look at what the three Hebrew boys said in Daniel 3. Even if our God did not save us, we are not going to do otherwise. We must continue to follow him. That is trust. That is trust. Our own our trust is if something we want to be done is not done. Ah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You see, we begin to back off from what we believe God to, or what we believe God for. God's people. We must confirm our trust is in him. That's why I said, woe unto those who trust in man. Woe unto those who trust in Egyptians. For Egyptians are not God. They are ordinary men. Ordinary people. But blessed is a man whose trust is in God. Because you choose to trust him. That's what Jeremiah declared in 17. Blessed is that man who trusts in God. So for you to enjoy Every time we try to repeat, recite, not actually confessing what we believe, but reciting Psalm 91. We recite, but we don't believe it. Sixth condition. We must have confidence in God as our deliverer from every pestilence. We must have confidence in God any moment that he's our deliverer, be it bird flu, Swine flu, whatever it is that comes as flu, pestilence, plague, we must always have our full confidence in God that he is our deliverer. He is our deliverer. 
so sad that when things begin to happen, even Christians are so scared, even like unbelievers. Yes, you have to take some precautionary measures, but you must not allow those precautionary measures to become agent of your fears. Yes, we must always hold on to God that he will deliver us from every pestilence. That is why in Isaiah, uh, sorry, in Exodus chapter 15, 26 says, I will not put the sickness or disease which I put in Egyptians. I will heal you for I am Jehovah who healeth you. I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who healed you. That's what it says. Yes, people around you will be going through things. But the Lord is the one who will deliver you. Because you put your confidence in him. The Bible declared in the book of 1 John chapter 5, this is the confidence that we have. That when we pray, he heareth us. He hears us. That's the confidence we have. When we pray, God hears us. It does not matter what you go through. It doesn't matter what the situation are. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Hold on and you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I've seen some children who were yeah, completely discarded, completely thrown away like they are not going to make it in life. But you see how God lift them up and they come out up to the top ladder of the corporate world. Because our ways are not God's ways. Our thinking is not his thinking. Our thought is not his thought. God's people. I always say don't write anyone off. Don't be so quick to write people off. If you write them off, they will surprise you. Because you are not God. I always said. You can see people who are down today. That does not mean they'll be down forever. They might be down now, tomorrow they'll be up there. Because you will never block people. God is the one who lifts up people. Remember what we read in 1 Samuel? Hannah said, You are God who lifts up the poor to sit among the princes to dine. What a joy. That comforts you. That you might be down today, tomorrow you'll be up there. Because the Lord knows what he's doing for your life. I always say it. When you are down to nothing, God is up to something. Next. Another condition, seventh condition. We must be utterly confident in God's protection. We must utterly be confident in God's protection. There are many times we are not even confident that God will protect us. Now look at what happened to Daniel in Lion's Den. He entered there. That's a hungry lion so waiting to devour him because that was the plan. But God Almighty sealed. And that was the testimony of Daniel. O king, live forever. For my God has sent his angels to seal the mouth of the lion that they could not harm me or hurt me. And that goes back to what the Bible told us as Luke, the doctor, declared. In the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I've given you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall in any form hurt you. God's word. That's what he declared. And that's what we see. You must have your utmost confidence in God for his protection. That God will protect you no matter what. No matter what the situation might be, that God will protect you. Even if everyone is going on, retrenchment, that you be protected. If everyone's interest is shaky, that you will not be affected. Yours will not be shaky. Because the Lord is your protector. You must have that confidence in God that he will never fail you. God does not fail his people, no matter what the situation are. Our problem is that we lack confidence in God. We lack it. We are always shaken up by just little things. We forget that our God is omnipotent God, which means his all-powerful God. That's who he is. He sent his word to protect us, to deliver us. He kept us from every arm, every arm and all dangers. He sustained us in every situation that tried to overwhelm us. That's why he is God. Eighth condition. Let God's truth be your shield and buckler. 
If you want to be protected, the truth of God must be a shield and buckler. That is why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Be it your property. Things can happen around, but yours will be protected. Because the Lord is your shield and your buckler. He shields you. He protects you. He keeps you from all dangers. It's a shield. There was an incident like this. A man came back from work. He's a very highly committed Christian. So he came back. He said it's been a long time. He has not gone to the swimming pool to have a dip. So he came back very late. About 10 in the night. So told the wife that he wants to have a shower. He wants to go and have some swimming. So they talk and talk. It's about 11.30 in the night. 11.30 p.m. So he told the wife, I just go down and come back. The wife said, it's too late. Why not wait tomorrow? You come back early. He said, no, I just want to. The wife said, I cannot go with you because I'm a bit tired. He said, it's okay. I'll just, just give me 15 minutes. I'll be back. The wife did not know that the water in the swimming pool had been completely drained because they are doing some work. So this man came with his everything, come, was ready to plunge in. Something made him to pull back. Second time, something made him to pull back. Because he just thanked God. That at least, because the, 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 the moon was up there. He said, thank God for moon. Everything just, every place was quiet. He just wanted to zoom. Jump from the deepest area. You know how to dive in. Two times that thing pulled him back. He didn't know. Then he stopped and watched. There was no single water. Anything called drain of water inside that swimming pool. He could have died there. Then he walked in and see this. He was shaking. He came back. Shaking the wife. said, what happened? He told the wife what happened. He said, God's people, the Lord is your shield. Many times we've done, there are many dangers you could have fallen in, but God pulled you back. He sends his angels, can send his spirit. He can also block you. God's people. He's your shield. He's your fortress. Be it when you drive. Many times you nearly get into accident, but you don't know how you just swing here and there. Your heart just beats fast. Oh, God just protected you. And keep you because it's your shield and your fortress. Not until we begin to know the Lord is our shield. Because of the truth of God that we embrace. Knowing the truth, the truth set us free because the truth is God himself. That's why in the book of John chapter 14 verse 6, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Because you know the truth. The truth shields you and the truth is your buckler. God's people. I've had many people that say, Pastor, I always recite Psalm 91, but sometimes it seems like nothing. Yes, you are reciting it, but you do not believe it. It's one thing to know about something. It's another thing to believe in what you know. Ninth point. We must not be afraid of any terrors, dangers, or pestilence, or destruction. When you are in every affair of life, or you're moving in anything of life, you must not be afraid. Fear is the greatest enemy of mankind. And when you are afraid, you cannot claim the promises of God because you're already giving yourself in to fear. Fear and faith cannot dwell together. Fear. This is one of the dangerous weapons in the hands of Satan. Satan uses fear to rob people their blessings. Satan uses fear to make you as an orphan without a heavenly father. Fear. I always ask people, what are you afraid of? Sometimes you ask them and say, I don't know. I don't really know. 
That's what we call fear psychosis. Do you know that what you are afraid is even afraid of you? The Bible told us in the book of Judges, very clearly, regarding, in chapter 7 and chapter 8, regarding Gideon. When Gideon called, was called to go and fight, the Lord told him point blank, you mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. He said, if the Lord is with us, how come all these things have been falling us? Where are the promises of God upon our lives? That God told him he bring us out of the land of Egypt. Where are the promises? Hasn't God left us? He began to speak things that are not in line. God said, haven't I called you? I'll be with you. And you destroy these people as one man. See, fear was there. Until God has to call him in chapter 7 and say, come. Come and listen to the dream of your enemies. And here, the, one of the enemies was telling his friend, you know, last night I had a dream. So tell me, what's a dream? Oh, I saw a loaf of bread coming all the way from the mountain and hit our camp and destroy everything. And the friend said, oh, oh, that loaf of bread you saw coming down is nothing but the sword of Gideon. When Gideon had the interpretation, the dream and interpretation, he ran and called his people and said, Arise, for the Lord has given all the enemies into our hands. You see, God's people. Many times we are afraid of things that are afraid of us. Do you know even sickness is afraid of you? Because he said, How? Yes. Because the Bible said in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, You are the temple of the Holy Ghost, you are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 said, For you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you are purchased with pride. Therefore glorify the Lord with your bodies. Satan cannot dwell in the body where God is. Sickness cannot affect you. So that is why God's fear must not take over your life, regardless of the situation you are in. There are people, even ministers, when we go through things, we become scared. As if we are going to die. As if God is going to forsake us there. As if God is no more on the throne. As if God has forgotten all our toil in his kingdom. Remember, God never forgets our good works. Nehemiah said it, God, remember my good works. Ezra said it, remember my good works. He never. Why are you afraid? And many people, when they have been out of job, they think they will never get a job anymore. Then they begin to speak like people of the world. You know, age is catching up. So now, when you reach my age, I cannot get a, you cannot get a job. You see? They begin to speak language of the unbelievers. To learn bad things is very easy, but to learn good things is very difficult. This morning in our devotion, I was asking the staff, did you hear what the Apostle Paul says? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I asked all of them, I said, if I scold you, how will you feel? One said, terrible. I asked another one, if I scold you, how will you feel? The other one said, horrible. I asked the other one, if I scold you, how will you feel? Say, devastating. You see? All big, big words. As if I scold them, yeah, so you have to share. You know. I'm a good boy, I don't scold them. Good boy, quiet, quiet boy. God's people. So you must be like a family where you talk to people and they feel free to talk to you. Some of us look approachable, but we're not approachable. But some of us don't look approachable, but they're very much approachable. Why has fear taking away all that God has for you. There are a few ways fear can come into your life, God's people. One, fear can come into your life by what you see. Because of what you see, you get scared. Second, fear can come into your life by what you hear. What you hear. Bad report. That's why some people, when they have gone to doctor, and doctor say, eh, hey, hey, eh, uh, it seems this is... Uh, Cancerous. Oh, their heart drop. Bible says, in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. But today, many people are bowing in the name of cancer. They're scared. 
Because of bad report, what they hear, what they see. And that thing that can bring fear into people's life is their past ugly experience. Because of their past experience, they have become scared. Oh, I think this might rep rep repeat again. I think this will repeat again. But God's people, the Bible says, don't go by sight, but go by faith. Tenth condition for the blessings. Believe that the plagues, the strange multitude around you will not harm you. Verses 7 and 8. Whatever are the pestilence, the plagues, destroying people around you will not touch you. Believe in that, which means what we're talking here is to believe in God. Believe, believe, believe. In that verse 7 and 8. A thousand may fall on your side and ten thousand on your right hand. But it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Just believe it will not touch you. It will not. That is why when Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Romans. In Romans chapter 10 verse 11 it says, If you believe, you will not be put to shame. Just believe. Just believe. Just believe. Just believe. Isaiah the prophet declared in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 9, but if you don't believe, you will not be established. If you don't believe, you will not be established. It's impossible to, to establish you. But 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20, Jehoshaphat the king declared, if you believe, you will be established and you will prosper. If you believe. All you need is just believe. Yes, Lord, you are able. Yes, Lord, I believe your word. Help my unbelief, Lord. I believe. I believe. Jesus asked the blind man and said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, very clearly, that I may see. And Jesus asked a question, do you believe I'm able to do this? He said, yes, Lord, you're able. He didn't say maybe or perhaps. He said, yes, Lord. He didn't ask Jesus, are you an eye surgeon? If you're an eye surgeon, you can do it. If you're not an eye surgeon, I doubt. He didn't say that. Look at Peter. After the death of Christ, Peter called out and said, let's go for fishing. And they thought throughout the night they couldn't get anything. And here, Jesus came and taught a professional fisherman. He said, hey, throughout the night we never got anything. He said, okay, why not launch in the deep? Now a carpenter is telling a professional fisherman how to fish. And Peter did not say, hey, can you get lost? I've been doing this job from childhood. I'm a professional fisherman. Who are you to tell me what to do? He just believed and throw in the net. Many times when we are told to do something, we try to analyze. Who is this person telling me this? What is your profession? You forget to know. It is not by power, not by might, but by the spirit of the living God. God's people. And now, condition. We must let God be our refuge also. Not only running to God as a refuge, we must let him be our refuge. He must be a place of a resting place. Whenever you are tired, be, be it physically or spiritually, always let the Lord be your resting place. The Lord spoke to the people of Israel and said, in case any of you were to kiss somebody inadvertently, you are going to, in my command, you are going to make a place of refuge. The person will run to that place so that he'll be safe. Run to the Lord as a place of your refuge. The Bible said, for the name of the Lord is a high tower. And the righteous run into it and he is saved. Run to the Lord. Run there. Jesus, Jesus. I'm in you, Lord. You're my Lord, my refuge. Every moment. Not cursing and swearing every time. Swearing and cursing. Crying and shedding crocodile tears. You know, many of us, when something happens, the only thing, first thing we do is throw crocodile tears. Ooh, river of Jordan, begin to come down. Instead of us to run to our place of refuge. In verse 9, let God be our habitation. We must always let God be our place of habitation. Learn to dwell in the presence of God. Always learn to dwell in the presence of God. Every moment. 
Sometimes people ask me this question, how do I stay in the presence of God? They think you must go and build one altar and sit down there. God is everywhere. Learn to always be in communication with God. Learn always to talk to him. Even when you want to take action, when you want to take decision, make sure you first present it to your Almighty. Even when you are hurt and broken, run to the presence of God. Run there, straight. Run to the presence of God. Go there. Don't do things because you know how to do it. As I was sharing with you, our problem is this, you know, problem of mankind. Because we know how to do a particular thing, we continue to neglect God. We just go and do it because I know what to do, because I know what to do. You forget to know, you might know what to do, but that thing is not what you're supposed to do at that moment. Just look at how God does his work through the Bible. There is one thing that every believer must know. God wants us to remember what he has done for us in the past, but he doesn't want us to repeat it. You must know that. For example, Joshua was there and see how God used Moses to divide the Red Sea. But it is not for Joshua to use the same method to divide the River Jordan when it was his time. You must always remember that. God wants us to remember his blessing upon our lives, his miracles, but don't try to repeat what God did. It will not work. It will not. But we must always remember that God is always there. Remember the battle that Moses went through while Joshua was with him. But when it was time, when Joshua took over by the command, he has to invade a fortified city of Jericho. He did not say, well, I know how we are going to fight this battle, but he began to seek the face of the Lord, how this battle is going to be fought. And the Bible told us God gave him a command, how they're going to circle that place for seven days, Seven times then, they have to shout and sound the trumpet. God always gives strategy on how to fight every battle of life. We must not try to be copycats. It might not work for us. There's something we must learn because God wants to be unique in your life and in my life. Be it in your workplace, be it anywhere you go. That we must always seek the face of the Lord. Seek his face. Many times people say, I sought his face, but I couldn't hear anything. Yes, he didn't hear, but continue seeking. The Bible told us very clearly in the book of Matthew chapter 7, it says, Knock, it shall be opened. Yes, knock and continue knocking. Seek and continue seeking and ask and continue asking. That's what it means. But don't judge. In verse 14, let your love be upon God. Our love must be upon God. You cannot love anybody sincerely, purely, without letting that love be upon God. That is why today, people can like you, but they will never love you. And I want to tell you something. You may give without love, but you cannot love without giving. It's the truth. Your love must be upon God. And that will be a pure love in your relationship with anybody. In sincerity and honesty. When devil tries to come in between that love, you know it. And you stand against it and pray it out. That's why when you read our book, we made it clear concerning love, true love and obsession. Some people are obsessed. They don't have true love. So your love must be upon God. The love that comes <clears throat> from our Lord Jesus Christ. The love that is spread across our heart by the Holy Ghost, as we read in the book of Romans chapter 5. The love that bears all things and believes all things. <clears throat> love that do not count on the wrong, don't to it. Love, love that do not always mention, mention the past. That's the love we're talking about. Love that believes in all things and allow God to be all in all because that love is built upon God. So when you, your love is built upon God, you can, you're able to 
embrace the blessings of God in Psalm 91 and move on. Some people can mistake you, but God does not mistake you. We must understand the name and authority of God also. If you want to embrace the blessings of God in Psalm 91, you must understand the name and authority of God. Because the name of God is more than anything you need in life. <clears throat> and authority of God cannot be questioned. Because it's authority that passes all authorities. So when you build your faith upon the foundation of God's authority, <clears throat> and also the authority of his name, you see things begin to change. You become what God wants you to be. Always under the power of humility. Power of joy. Wherever you are, people around you will feel accepted and feel loved and feel cared for. They will not feel insecure. They will not be fearful. They will not feel that, well, it's quite scary to be with this person. Last and not the least in verse 15. Then we can call upon God in prayer. Call upon him. You will not be scared of calling upon the name of the Lord because you know there is not any single thing that separates you and God. He didn't allow sin to come in. That is why in Psalm 50 verse 50 says, Call upon me in the time of trouble. I will answer you and I will leave you and you shall glorify my name. In Psalm 55, 22, call upon me for I will not allow the righteous to be moved. Isaiah 45, 22, call upon me all you inhabitants of the earth and be saved. Call upon me, call upon me, that's what God said. So in danger, in every moment, you can call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Call upon his name and you'll be completely redeemed. Because that is the will of God. God's people. This Psalm 91. Yes, everyone is cited. But there are things, hidden treasures. That we need to hold on. So that when we confess it. We know what we are confessing. We are not reciting a poem. But we are confessing what we believe. Confessing what we stand for. Sins of God. God does not promise a world. Free from danger. But. He does promise his help whenever we face danger. You must always remember that. God did not promise you a world without danger. But he promised you and I his help in a time of danger. You must know it. That's something you must know. God does not prom promise us a smooth journey, but he promises us a safe journey. The journey can be very rocky, very rough, but the Lord promises a safe journey. You must always remember that. Wherever you are, in every situation, always remember the circumstance around you has come to question what you believe in God. Question what you stand for God. Question your righteousness. Question your joy in the Lord. But one thing is this. That that circumstance will turn out to be for your testimony. Turn out to be for your joy. So that the name of the Lord be glorified. It is easy to follow the Lord if you are willing to pay the price. The price, the greatest price being paid by our Lord Jesus Christ. But all we need now is just obedience and trust. Embracing the truth with wholeheartedness. And allowing him to be all in all for us. That we practice what we have been taught and we practice what we preach and we follow on with God that any moment we can say for me to live is Christ to die is gain. Glory be to the name of the Lord. When you hear the voice of God, you don't have it in your heart.